Hey guys, today we're looking at Hicks Law. So, if we're thinking about information processing, we've talked about it. First of all, we detect stimuli, that travels through, then we make some kind of decision making when we choose a relevant motor program. And then last of all, there's always some kind of muscular contractions. And when we've looked at memory models, we kind of just fill in the gaps with selective attention, uh, DCR process, initiating motor programs. Okay, so today we're looking at Hicks law, which is linked to somebody's response time. Okay, so response time is from the start of a stimuli to the end of a movement. Okay, so if we're thinking about a penalty, the start of the stimuli would be from the moment the person who is kicking the ball actually makes contact with the ball. And if you're the goalkeeper, your response time would be to you making a save. Okay, so if we're looking here, we're measuring our response time in milliseconds. And then on, at the bottom, we've got our number of possible responses to the stimuli, okay? Now what you'll notice is, generally, or pretty much in all situations, the lower the number of responses, the also the quicker the response time. Now you've got to be careful when you're explaining this stuff because if you say faster, slower, higher, lower, right? If I say the higher my response time, okay, that actually means I'm getting slower. Yeah? So you've got to be careful with when you're saying those things. So look, as the number of responses increases, so does response time. Then eventually we hit here. Okay, in here, where we're gonna hit, that is nowhere near it, but it's fine. Um, around here, where after 10 possible responses, response time is gonna hit something called a plateau. A plateau is a period of time where there is no significant change in response time. Okay, just I'll say that again. So a plateau is where as response time further increases, there is going to be no significant change in response time. So look, it hits 600 milliseconds, here, or just above 600 milliseconds. So this is what we would say. Hicks law, all right, is where as the number of possible responses increases, so does response time. After 10 possible responses, there it is going to hit a plateau where there is no significant change in response time. Okay, that happens at 10 possible responses. Think how many responses are going on in a game at any one time. From there, we can apply this, okay? So a question is gonna use something like this. So using examples from tennis, explain how the relationship shown in figure four above will affect its time taken for a, a player to respond to an opponent's shot. So, for example, right, we're playing a rally, we're playing back and forth, okay, you find it really, really easy, you're probably going to respond to your opponent's shot really, really quickly, because you're just playing forehands and backhands, and that is exactly what you are used to, right? So, we would say something like, if the performer or the opposition plays an expected shot, for example, the example is important because it has to be linked to tennis. If they play an expected shot, such as a forehand, then our response time would be quicker. Yeah, because that is the number of possible responses to that would obviously decrease. However, on the other side of it, you could also say, however, if they play an unexpected shot, that would be something like a volley over your head or a drop shot. Think about how long it takes for you to respond to that stimuli. It would take longer. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. So Hicks law is as the number of possible responses increases, so does response time. After 10 possible responses, we hit a plateau where there is no significant change in response time. If the opposition plays an expected shot, then response time will decrease. For example, a forehand shot. However, if the opponent plays an unexpected shot, for example, a drop shot, response time would take longer and would increase. Yeah, another easy way to think about this is think about how long it takes you to make a decision when you are playing a game such as netball, such as football, when you are on the ball, 
it's definitely, definitely a little bit longer because you've got to take in all the stimuli. You've obviously got pass dribbling and shooting if you're taking into account something like basketball as well. However, at the start of a race, a 100 meter race, you are literally, there is one response, there is literally just sprint as soon as you hear the gun. So as a result, response time would be faster. Okay, that's the first thing we're looking at today. The second thing is the single channel hypothesis and it links really, really closely with Hick's law. It's just somebody else's theory. So this is the single channel hypothesis. Each of these is a stimuli. Okay, so you've got ball, crowd, um, I don't know, one of your players, another one of your players in the opposition, right? There, there's obviously going to be a lot more in a game scenario. Now look in here, decision making. You can see the little dots going across. That is because, if you remember our memory models, we always went from four arrows to one. That is because I can only send on one piece of information at any one time, okay? So because I can only send on one piece of information at any one time, this stimuli, okay, whatever it is, has to wait until this one has been processed. And this is why selective attention becomes really important because if this is the crowd and this is the ball, I'm not focusing on the ball for a very short period of time, but here I would be getting something called information overload, wouldn't I? Because I'd be focused on too many pieces of information. So if we're looking at this, use the single hand hypothesis to explain why there's a delayed response by a player in tennis when their opponent's shot hits the top of the net and changes direction. Now in our heads, this is probably common sense. If the ball hits the net, it's probably quite hard to respond to. Yeah, so a performer can only process one piece of information at any one time. Process in terms of taking the stimuli and making a decision with it. Now if we're thinking about the short term memory, I can hold seven to nine. Yeah, seven to nine pieces of information. So if a second stimuli, okay, arrives before the initial shot has been processed, so my first stimuli would be responding to an initial forehand shot, right? So I'm watching that ball coming to me, that's the first stimuli. The second stimuli would be the ball hitting the net. But this second stimuli has arrived before I have processed the initial shot, okay? Therefore, has to wait until the first one's been processed. Let me start that again. So first of all, I can only process one piece of information at any one time. If a second stimulus arrives while the first one is being processed, then the second stimulus must wait. It just has to wait. That means my response to the second stimuli would take longer. Yeah, because it has to wait. And that is known as a psychological refractory period. That is something you've just got to remember. It's called the psychological refractory period. As a result, the player responds too late. So if you're playing, think about it, you've probably played tennis or, or even badminton. Someone plays a shot, you're waiting for it because you, you've kind of worked out where you think it's going to go. So that's you responding to that stimulus. However, it hits the net. As a result, it just kind of dies in front of you. You either only just make it, or you don't make it at all. Now, if you knew that was going to happen, clearly you just move forward, but that's not the case. We are still processing that first stimuli. So this is what another question might look like. Explain, using figure one, the psychological refractory period. So you get a mark for saying, above, Okay, is known as the single channel hypothesis. If it says single channel hypothesis in the question, then you get a mark for calling it the psychological refractory period. Yeah, so keep that in mind. On the other, so you would say, first of all, the defender can only process one piece of information at any one time. If the performer, right, or if the second stimuli, which is gonna be this performer changing direction, arrives, before this defender has processed that dummy pass, so he's going there and then changing direction, okay? If they are still processing this pass and thinking the ball is gonna go that way, then 
their response to the second stimuli takes longer i.e. them changing direction, they're going to step the wrong way, the play is going to go the other way. Yeah, so you'd say, it's known as singleton hypothesis. If the second stimuli arrives before the third one's been processed, then the second stimuli must wait. This means that the response to the second stimuli will take longer. As a result, you need a little bit of impact in here, as you would say, as a result, they won't be able to tackle them. Okay, thanks for that guys. I will put the notes in the PowerPoint kind of after the slide where I put this link. Um, and I want you to copy up your notes. Please let me know if you're struggling with any of this. Thank you guys.